Okay, so um, I want to show you all how to use. So now again, recap, refresh, re whatever. We're talking about quadratic equations and we're talking about solving them. And we're talking about different methods to solve them. But we're focusing right now on the second method, square root property. So I showed you some examples where we just straight up went straight into the square root property. But I want to talk about completing the square as well. Now, you don't technically need to know or to do or to use this method to solve a quadratic equation. You can get away without ever using completing the square. It's my least favorite. But you need to know how to complete the square for other scenarios that require it. For example, if you go into like, you know, the standard equation of a circle, you need to know how to complete the square to convert into that. So there are situations where you need to know how to complete the square, you have no choice. But if you are solving quadratic equations, you technically do have a choice. You don't have to use completing the square, but you need to know how to do it. So we'll talk about it. Now, completing the square is always ideal when there's a coefficient of one in front of X squared. So that is always the first thing that you're looking for. If not, then, you know, you get fractions and stuff. I'll show you how to do that. But right now it's a beautiful situation. So I have a, a one in front of the X squared. Now, you know, the first thing I would do is look at this, you know, standard equation of a quadratic. And I would say, you know, it has three terms. So I can't do what I did before and isolate the squared term and get just a number on the right. So I can't go straight into the square root property. I might initially try to factor it, but it doesn't factor, right? Um, so then there are other methods. So I could either complete the square to solve this or use the quadratic formula. So we're going to solve it by completing the square. And in my next video, I'll show you how to do the same problem by using the quadratic formula. And I'll show you that you get the same exact thing regardless of which method you use. So it's a preference, but you need to know both anyway, because there are other situations that require either completing the square or the quadratic formula. So completing the square, step one, the goal is to create a perfect square trinomial. So you need to input a number here next to your two X terms. And this guy, this 30, he's not needed. He's going to the right-hand side. So bring your constant to the right and add a little box to imply that I am completing the square. And what goes into this box is a number to create a perfect square trinomial. How do I determine the number that goes into this box? It is always and forever b over 2 squared. What is b? b is the coefficient in front of the x term. In this example, b is negative 10. So I have a negative 10 over 2 squared. b over 2 squared, always the coefficient in front of the x terms um, over 2 squared, or whatever you know variable you're using. It could be y, it could be x, whatever it is. So negative 5, right? Negative 10 divided by 2 is negative 5 squared is positive 25. So 25 goes into this box to complete the square. But it's an equation. And initially, I didn't have that 25. And I just added 25 to one side of the equation. So now it's not balanced. So what do I need to do? Balance my equation and add that same number to the right. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. Otherwise, it is not a balanced equation. And then I you know, did everything wrong. I changed the actual thing. You know, <laughs> Change the equation. We're not allowed to change the equation. So once you get it into this form, the idea behind completing the square is to create that perfect square trinomial, which factors into an X plus or minus a number, the quantity squared. It creates that binomial squared. Um, well, let's do the right-hand side, that's easy. Negative 30 plus 25 is negative five. So I have a negative five on the right. On the left, you could factor the trinomial if you choose, right? But you get situations that might be a little more complicated later on. So there's a trick to determine what goes next to your X Whatever was inside the parentheses here, the b over 2, is what goes here before you square it. That's what goes into your little um, parentheses next to your x when you're factoring. So in this case, it was a negative 10 over 2 or a negative 5 before I squared it. So I get a minus 5 here. And if you factor this, you'll see it's x minus 5 times x minus 5. I completed the square. Boom. 
technically I'm done, but I'm not really because I didn't solve the equation, but I'm done with the completing the square process. I completed the square. That's what this is to get it to this. That's the whole point of completing the square. But now that I completed the square, look what I created. I create, created a situation where now I can use that square root property. Now I can say, well, I have the square term on the left, a constant on the right. So now I can apply the square root property, square root both sides, and then finish it off. Now, this is an interesting situation. So first, let's do the left-hand side. I have x minus 5, right? Because the square root kind of cancels that squared case. And on the right, I have the square root of negative 5. Whenever I have a square root of a negative number, here pop up my complex cases. So this simplifies into i times the square root of positive 5. Uh, if you need to know how to simplify this, you have to go back into other videos and simplify in complex numbers. Um, but anytime you have a negative under square root, it converts into your i situation. Um, and typically, we put the i in front only because you, know, you could put the i behind it, but you don't want to mistake it to being under the square root. It's not. Um, and then I'm missing one thing. Um, anytime I use the square root property, I get a plus or minus in front every time. So I have not only a negative under the square root, which created an I case, but also a plus or minus in front because I applied and used the square root property and I need two solutions to a quadratic. I'm not done. Why am I not done after all that? Because I want X and I don't want X minus five. So now I have to add five to both sides to finish it off. So like I said, you know, completing the square is not my favorite situation. Oops, I don't want x minus five. It's just x. x on the left equal to positive five. I don't need to write the positive part. Plus or minus i times the square root of five, and this is my solution. What are my two solutions? One of them is five minus i times the square root of five, and one of them is five plus i times the square root of five. Sometimes you're asked to write them separately. Whatever, same thing. Okay, so it's a complex number, my solution actually. But that's, co that's completing the square. Now, I wanna do another one just real quick in this particular video. Let's see if I could do it kind of fast. Uh, 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 uh. So let's do minus 12 plus X3. I'm randomly making this up. Now, it's a quadratic equation it's in standard form, correct? Um, it has three terms. So I'm not going to go straight into the completing the, uh, sorry, the square root property. So I might try to factor it and see if it factors. If not, then I'm going to either complete the square or quadratic formula. I'm going to complete the square because that's what we're doing. And then in the next video, I'll show you the same problem by um, quadratic formula. So you could practically, you could see they're the same. You could choose which method you want but you need to know both. So I'm gonna start by doing the same thing I did before, bringing my X terms, keeping them on the left and then bringing this constant term on the right because he's not needed. But the problem is that I said that I needed a coefficient in front of my squared term and I needed it to be a one. In my last example, it was, I had no problem, right? The coefficient was one. Here it's not. So now I have an extra step. Not a big deal. It's possible. It's all possible. All right. I have to factor out whatever the coefficient is from my x group. And when I do that, I have x squared minus 6x. And I'm going to say plus some number to complete the square equal to negative 3. Now, this factor 2 does not affect this negative 3. This is one method. Another method is to divide everything by 2. I mean, it all depends on what you want to do. Um, so if I were to distribute this back through, it would be the same thing that I had initially. Okay, now I want to determine what goes into my box to complete that square, quote unquote, complete the square, to create the perfect square trinomial so that I could factor it into that beautiful situation. I take B, in this case, my B is negative six, take B, divide it by two, and square it. So B in this case is negative six, divided by two is negative three, and negative three squared is positive nine. 
So cool, I completed the square, but I added a number to one side of the equation, which unbalanced it. So I have to do the same thing to the other. But what did I really add to the left? I did not add a nine because the nine is contained inside these parentheses. So I didn't add a nine. If I were to distribute this two back through, I actually added a two times nine. I added an 18 to the left, which means that I need to add an 18 to the right. So when there's a coefficient in front of x squared other than one and you factor it out, you be careful when you complete the square and then put a number there because you're not technically um, adding nine, you're adding two times nine because it's placed inside parentheses. So I technically added an 18 to the left. So I technically have to add an 18 to the right. Okay, now the whole purpose is to convert it to this. Um, the right-hand side, it will just put that 15, right? That's easy, negative three plus 18. Here, I have to figure out what goes into the parentheses and it should be an X plus or minus a number, right? And I said, the trick is whatever was inside here or B over two, whatever you, know, you had here before you squared it is what goes here, right? That's my little trick to determine you know, what goes there. And in this case, it was a negative three. And if you factored x squared minus six x plus nine, you would get an x minus three times an x minus three. So now I'm very close to where I need to be. Very close, I'm not there yet, why? Because I wanna solve for x, right? That's the goal. Well, remember that I said, if I'm using the square root property, I need just the squared term on the left and constants on the right. And this two here is now in my way. So I need to divide everything by two. This is where it gets ugly with completing the square also because of the fact that fractions could happen or they do happen. Um, so this two goes away and I'm left with just X minus three on the left squared equal to 15 halves. And now I'm ready for my square root property. Now I have something squared on the left, my constant on the right. Now I can apply the square root property where I square root both sides to clear out that squared case. And now I can say, well, this is just X minus three equal to, I have to simplify this. It's a plus or minus the square root of 15 over two. Now I can't leave it this way. This is where, you know, completing the square could be a pain in the you know what. I need to go on the side here. Let's talk about the square root of 15 over two. I can't leave it like this. Now the square root of the whole, you know, the whole quotient 15 over two is the same thing as the square root of 15 over the square root of two. But guess what? You can't leave a radical on the bottom of a fraction. So you need to rationalize. And if you don't remember how to do that you need to review those videos. I get the square root of 30 on the top divided by the uh, square root of two times the square root of two which is two. Now 30, three times 10, there, 30 is not a perfect square. There's no factor of 30 that is a perfect square. So I'm going to now replace this here with its simplified version. It's version that's proper, square root of 30 over two, so that I don't have a radical in the denominator. So I simplified it over here and I pulled it back in. I'm not done because I want, I want X, I don't want X minus three. So I have to add three to both sides. So I get that X is equal to positive three plus or minus the square root of 30 all over two. Well, the square root of 30 over two. This is my solution. Now, sometimes you're asked to, you know, rewrite this maybe as a single expression or maybe separate it three minus the square root of 30 over two or three plus the square root of 30 over two. There are different ways that you could represent this answer. Both of them or all of them are exactly the same. So we talked about the square root property and completing the square which goes into the square root property. I wanna do the quadratic formula next. That'll be my next video, but I'll do it with these exact same problems so as I'll show you, you get the same solution regardless of whether or not you complete the square. 
So typically my preference is if I'm going to go ahead and solve a quadratic equation, if it does not factor or if it's not in this form such that I can go straight to the square root property, I go to the quadratic formula. But I still know how to complete the square because, like I said, there are other things in mathematics that require completing the square. But I can get away with it without uh, using it in the quadratic equations. All right, so let's go into the next video.